Okay, I think we can get started, Lynn. Are we good to start? Well, fantastic. First and foremost, welcome everyone to the annual 2021 Peter uh, Lamy Memorial Lecture. I couldn't be more excited on so many different levels. One, that we're back in person um, in one of my favorite states of California and accompanied by a colleague and friend. This is actually our first time working together in person, in person right? Yeah. We've been on Zoom a lot together. Um, so I'm gonna get us started in terms of the program. Just to make sure you know you're at the right session, we're gonna be talking about if you're not at the table or if you're not at this lecture, you might be on the menu. You, a pharmacist's journey in national health policy development. And you'll hear and learn more about Dr. Jonathan Watanabe if you don't know him. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Brandt. I'm a pharmacist and the executive director at the Lamy Center um, and really excited to be representing our team here. During this session together, we're gonna to talk about some of the federally mandated consensus reports and somehow these reports uh, improve medication management, especially with respect to cost and waste. We'll define the integration of a pharmacist on healthcare savings and outcomes. And then more importantly is to talk about the increasing role of pharmacist and pharmacist leadership um, and some of the changes in the healthcare policy arena and really focus on Dr. Watanabe's work, Jonathan's work uh, today together. And just to give you a lens, it's been a journey, I think, for all of us in the pharmacy education field, practice field, and research field. So I want to take a moment to do a shout out to my team at the University of Maryland. Some of them are teaching this afternoon and covering our outreach initiatives, as well as continuing our research. So those of you not familiar with the LAMI Center, we are going into our 45th year in 2022. Woohoo! one of the oldest aging centers. Sorry, Dr. Gray over there, one of the younger aging centers <laughs> in the School of Pharmacy, but we're one of the oldest, actually, I think we are the oldest aging center in a School of Pharmacy. But you guys look great. We look, well, thank you, thanks. Yeah. We're, we're trying to yeah. age well. Yeah. We've got the secret fountain of youth over there. <laughs> But in all sincerity, our mission, if you guys were here this morning hearing from the Navy SEAL mom mission, others before yourself, um, an uh, acronym, I think that's so important. So our mission has not changed in those almost 45 years as a center, and really it's about improving drug therapy um, for older adults, aging adults, through innovative research, education, and clinical initiatives. So I just want to take a moment so I think I'm going over here, but I wanna give you an idea of what's happening in our research realm. So the LAMI Center being in Baltimore and very close to DC and many of these public agencies has been instrumental in influencing healthcare policy. So our current NIA funded work, which will be wrapping up next year and has been presented at some national meetings and we continue to present, is focusing on antipsychotics. You've heard a lot about antipsychotics, but also psychoactive meds in nursing homes after the National Partnership for Patients in terms of improving dementia care. So you'll be hopefully seeing a rebuttal to the New York Times article coming out in the next couple of weeks. Our team will be sharing some of the work we're doing there. We've also have been uh, co-leading uh, with a colleague here in UCLA some of the work on USD prescribing and stakeholder engagement and patient engagement, which is really exciting on medication optimization um, as well. So we were recently awarded a PCORI project. Um, and we continue to do uh, work uh, in the enhanced MTM space, uh, working with CMMI on some of those demonstration models. So more to come on that, uh, that uh, model that will be actually retiring at the end of this year. Um, education, a shout out to Dr. Whitaker and the team um, in terms of directing educational programs. Uh, we are actually another celebration milestone. Last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary uh, for our residency, our PGY2 residency, so I was really excited about that. Yes, again, one of the oldest programs in the country. Oof. I know, we're Theme just, woohoo, yeah. yeah, old, old and aging, um, but well. we're all getting younger. So, but in all sincerity, and we're super excited to have our second uh, fellowship, and this year, actually, we've been able to partner with this year's fellow, actually, who's going into his second year and almost graduating, working with ASCP and some of the public policy stuff. So super excited about the education. We have students here for their pathway um, in geriatrics, and we continue to partner with Hopkins as well as others uh, in Maryland on our Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. And actually, in 2019, right before the COVID launch, we became part of the Age-Friendly University uh, movement. So really excited by that. And 
And then clinical, we still continue to provide care out in the community, another arm of our work, especially interprofessional. And we've actually taken our model internationally and working with colleagues in uh, both Australia as well as in Finland. So we've been really excited. So the COVID was tough, but it kept us moving. And we're really excited because during this pandemic, we've really had to focus on partnership and stakeholders and engagement. So some of our past LAMI lecturers, uh, like Dr. Karen Pellegrin, Dr. Brian Isis, and now our most recent LAMI lecturer, Dr. Watanabe, is joining that prestigious group in terms of helping us to collaborate and focus on meaningful healthcare policy and pharmacist role. So amazing, amazing accomplishments. Um, and he's actually going to share more of his journey, but you can see some of his disclosures, especially because he'll be talking about his work with the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, Dr. Watanabe, I don't want to read your bio, but I want to hear about your career and how it's evolved in terms of your informing healthcare policy. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Nikki. And, yeah. and thank you again to ASCP, uh, the Lamy Center, and yourself for putting this together. Just a, it's a real thrill to be talking about something that um, I would be talking about for fun. So to, to be able to present about pharmacist role and policy is, is something I'm incredibly passionate about. So, I mean, I think that uh, in terms of the title of this is if you're not at the table, uh, you might be on the menu. Um, I think that the, the table that I sit at that's probably the biggest is the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Forum on Drug Discovery, Development, and Translation. Um, who sits at that table is the current FDA commissioner, interim, interim tag is uh, Janet Woodcock, as well as the former FDA commissioner and current head of Google um, Health Policy and Strategy, Robert Califf. So certainly have the opportunity there to share a lot about the pharmacist role and our increasing importance, I think, um, in, in health policy, both within the United States and even beyond. So, and I'm, I am a practicing geriatric pharmacist, I'm board certified uh, through ASCP and something that informs just about everything that I do. Um, and that, uh, that's taken the shape of working at long-term care pharmacy, working in uh, PACE clinics in San Diego. Uh, I think I see my fellow up there somewhere, former fellow, um, where we worked at several different PACE clinics in San Diego, as well as a skilled nursing facility that was supported by um, a community hospital in San Diego. So throughout the process that I think it is, it's geriatric pharmacy that has informed an incredible amount of the policy work uh, that I do. So going way back, um, actually I really got into, the reason I did my PharmD was, to, to, was to for a role in pharmaceutical policy. So uh, pretty early on I actually had read at a variety of universities, actually not a variety, a few universities had a track in pharmaceutical policy um, and the best mechanism to do that was, was through the PharmD. So that's why I initially um, went to the University of Southern California because they have an institute for economic policy uh, that I was really interested in working with those guys. Uh, spent tremendous time there. In fact, I was able to kind of cut my teeth on some projects in economics uh, while I was there working with Kaiser Drug Information Services. I actually had an exciting project working with the pharmacy supervisor for LA County Department of Health Services on developing their uh, drug formulary and then their, later on their drug delivery program for their public private provider clinics. And, um, um, and the next role was working with um, some folks on the PNT looking at specialty medications and off-label drug use. And it really, became, it really became clear to me then that pharmacists had just have an incredibly inordinate role in both pharmaceutical-related activities as well as health in general and where that translates kind of into society. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I had known, that there's just mechanisms of, of improving health in some ways, the most efficient way to do that is through medications, but there was many places where that was not being done the most effectively. I, was, I kind of marveled at these uh, early analyses that showed that there was medicines that were less effective, but um, I mean less, less costly, but more effective. That just kind of really stimulated my interest. Um, worked on a, through some internships with Amgen. It's a long story, but they all kind of make sense. It, it, and then that actually, through their global payer planning group, that just got me interested in working with some global health economics people. Mm -hmm. That stirred um, a discussion with um, the University of Washington, now the dean there, Sean Sullivan, about trying to construct a fellowship that was um, industry funded, but that would work with the university to build a master's in health econ, which I think is now in its 15th or 16th iteration. Um, but based, once I arrived there, just became more interested in doing a, a PhD on outcomes and economics and um, kind of jettisoned me on to a faculty career. Pretty early on, um, 
there was the National Academy of Medicine Fellowship uh, that I was fortunate to be selected for. And this was kind of a, the project of a lifetime. I would, have, I would have worked for 30 years to be a part of this project that I was fortunate to walk in for my orientation at the Keck Center in DC. And they were discussing this new project that it was supported by the Senate uh, called the Making Medicines Affordable, a, a National Imperative, that's the name of the report, but a committee that was going to examine um, affordability of medications and what we could do to make medications more accessible, more sustainable, but also protect innovation in the United States as kind of the major provider of, of medications. And um, I was there at their first discussion, and then um, they did not have a pharmacist that was supporting that committee, so I was able to serve um, as the fellow that supported that. And um, uh, just an amazing experience. There was the Secretary of Health of Louisiana, uh, Rebecca Gee, served on that committee. The Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, Alan Weil, was on that committee. Um, former Senator of New Mexico, Jeff Bingaman. Um, uh, let's see, it's Henri Termier, who Harrison Ford played in a, in a movie. Uh, <laughs> he was the founder of Genzyme. He served on that committee. And then it was headed by the former CEO of Lockheed. So, I mean, it was just a which was really interesting, except for when you find out that basically this is a systems issue, and so you actually need kind of engineering mindset. And so I remember he quipped once that, uh, you know, they, they, they told me that, that to figure out the U.S. healthcare system, uh, you're going to need a rocket, you know, it's, 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 it's beyond rocket science, so they went and found a rocket scientist. And then within a couple, I think with probably about a month into the project, he actually said it was easier to get a man to the moon than to understand our healthcare system in terms of its yeah. complexity. Don't do um, that. So it, it, no. uh, it just uh, went a lot of directions. I was able to then work in um, the Emergence Leaders Program for the National Academy of Sciences, and that actually opened up a lot of doors in terms of working on older adult uh, workshop programming projects that I'm really passionate about. And, Can you talk and about that a little bit? Because I think we have some emergent leaders in this audience. Talk yeah. About, yeah. It was, and all of this was, was predicated on you're going to have information, all of you, that, that those decision makers in DC and beyond absolutely cherish and need, but they may not know that you have it until you present it to them. And so um, that's where that began with the NAM Fellowship. And then there was a real world evidence workshop that I was able to participate in. And then what became obvious was there was just a lot of questions related to medications that were first and foremost mm -hmm. on FDA and NIH's mind. And so um, just made a few different comments. And what I was excited to see is the, the leadership was, they just embraced it. Because I, I think that, I, and I've seen this in other places, that many times some of our, our biggest champions are actually not pharmacists. They actually just know the value of it. That's exactly what, what unfolded there. There were some physicians that led that committee, um, one from Kaiser in Seattle, and then the other is, is Dr. Califf. Um, that they really were looking for pharmacist expertise. And, and even as students in your first year, you will have a lot of that information that, that is, is not within access to many decision makers and policy makers. And so it's, it's showing up at those discussions, providing some viewpoints, because once they've heard it, they can't forget it. Mm -hmm. um, and then asking about how you can help. Uh, I often get, I, I'm so, I, People that want to get involved in policy, the dialogue is many times is just let them know a little bit about your background and that you're interested in participating, and it just kind of goes from there. Well, I think it gets to that theme of being present and at the table. I have to say I love the write-up that University of California, Irvine, where you're at now, did about you and the economic angle. I think your father was in economics, which yeah. kind of leads us into the, the health, what keeps you up at night. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll roll right into that. Yeah, I'm yeah. just going to go forward, not back. So even though when we talk about this, we might be going back, yeah, right? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I think it, yeah, this hasn't just kept me up like at night. This has kept mm -hmm. me up for the past... 10 years probably. So I think um, what we know, and it hasn't gotten any better, I think for the last three years in the United States is actually life expectancy has shortened. But it's your, what you're seeing off to the left is, um, is where the United States actually ranks in terms of life expectancy in the world. So we're, we're dead last in the developed world and we're not even in the top 20 when you look at the entire world. And I, I think that the, the challenge is that we spend much, much more. So if you look at a lot of these kind of graphs, we look like an outlier. Uh, I think for, in statistics, you probably would have dropped us off of the, from the data set uh, because we look, just look so far off. But I think that those are the, par the parts that are troubling is if we're, having, if we're, if we're not delivering life expectancy as, as we probably should, 
then why are we paying so much? So we're going to try to have to ascertain uh, what we can do to better make the most of our dollar. And I, I've, I got into this business because I think pharmacists are a part of that solution. And I, I firmly agree that most of healthcare, or most of health, is not delivered from healthcare. That's from social determinants, uh, that's societal, but a huge chunk, but a, but a big chunk of it is. And so if there's better ways to make something of that dollar that we spend in, um, than we should. And again, it's not so much that life expectancy has always been decreasing in the United States. It actually has been going up fairly consistently until the last few years. It's just that the rest of the world is going up much faster. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out what we can learn from these places. Yeah, and I have to say, when I look at this, you know, I look at it at the positive angle, looking at Japan, who has one of the longest life expectancy yeah. and one of the rapidly growing populations over the age of 85. What are they doing well? You yeah. know, and, and thinking about models of care and, and some of the ways we look at that. I think we were talking about this yesterday, just in terms of how much we're spending on medications, right? Uh, which is tremendous, which, you know, not our, just we as a society are spending on medications, but what our patients are spending on medications. Yeah. So talk about this Kaiser because this was actually before yeah. the pandemic and yeah. at least my clinician had here is going to say it's probably worse after the pandemic. Yeah. So speak a little bit about this study. I, I mean, I think that probably everybody in the room is yeah. familiar with this concept, it, but that um, if, you, if you have less insurance coverage or co-payments or higher, you are more likely to not take your medications or skip a dose. So these, are, these are kind of these... Um, non-required modifications in the dose that lead to non-effectiveness. So I, I think the other troubling part is, if you're doing kind of these kind of things, it's almost worse because you're, um, you're still paying for uh, the, to fill a prescription every other month, but you're not getting the benefit of that medication that you would if you had taken it on time. And I think the part, this is one of those where everybody would theoretically win if we actually, if they were able to be more adherent. The pharmacy would, would be paid for that prescription, the drug companies would get those, those medications sold, and the patient would have the benefit of having it, and the health system would have a reduction in ED visits and hospitalizations. So this is, you know, this is really troubling to see that uh, this direct correlation between uh, insurance status or income and the likelihood that you're not going to take medications that you should. Uh, but you know, we really do need to be a part of that solution, and part of that is kind of explaining how this works, that many folks, this, they do not understand how the kind of the medication or the administration system works, and we do. And so, uh, to inform those discussions, because I think a lot of times uh, policymakers, they will, it's, it's too easy to kind of do the simple solution. I think that's how we landed up with the donut hole, part D, and all these kind of like these, right. these things that um, uh, need to be informed a lot more by, by pharmacist input. Yeah, we were talking about this at the Washington Update of the smoothing of some of the out-of-pocket expenditure, especially at the beginning of the year. And I know one of the things we've been looking at on a national level and state level is the whole demonstration with the insulin program, right? And what's been fascinating for those of you involved in helping older adults navigate Medicare Part D choices and plans and MAPD plans is that those uh, premiums are much higher for those, one, for those plans that cover insulin at $35 a month, right? And so I think it's a challenge for all of us to navigate that adherence when the cost may be shifting, right, right during the year. So let's shift the cost here now. We're talking about clinician-administered medications, and Medicare is spending a fair amount in this realm in the doctor's office for some of these clinicians-administered meds. And we know that pharmacists are increasing their role in the physician's office, um, but Tell us a little bit about this study. Yeah, I think what yeah. we're seeing here was, was actually the impetus for, for the uh, consensus report that we'll talk about in the mm -hmm. next few slides. But this is basically just this demonstrated the number of Part D drugs. So these clinician or physician-administered medications, these specialty meds, are just going up. Um, and, we, and we all kind of know this. As we get to more specialty medications, uh, more things that are immunotherapies and genomic-based, that there are these increasing number of injectable meds um, that cost an enormous amount of money. And they're a little bit more complex, and the, and the distribution channels are, are certainly more complicated. And as those increase, um, that is going to absorb a larger amount of, of the Medicare spend and, and pharmacist time. And so to try, really try to grapple with this is, this is coming, or it's here, and it's only accelerating. So to get more comfortable with how we are going to guide kind of usage of clinician-administered drugs as it increases. 
Yeah, and, and I was sharing with Jonathan, we in our practice have a bone health service and we just underwent an audit because we uh, use Prolia in our clinic. And so we had a nice CMS audit because we were an outlier within the practice and how much we were getting reimbursed. So it was, um, it's always nerve wracking as many of us who've gone through audits and you might be at risk for losing some of those healthcare dollars. So I think pharmacists have an opportunity, but they have to be very mindful of all the CMS and other payer angles to that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that's a huge part of it is mm -hmm. that the, the challenge is, is it's actually as there's more pressure kind of on the, the medication pharmacist complexity side, mm -hmm. then you've got to get more pharmacists that are kind of ready to have that dialogue mm -hmm. with, with policymakers and regulators. Um, and so hopefully that's what we inspire here. Absolutely, because what we learned is their guidelines are a little outdated in the reimbursement realm, which yeah. we could probably spend some time yeah, talking we'll, about, we right? Will, and we yeah. will. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities, especially on the operations side. Sure. So, and some of the work that you've been doing. So this um, this was a study that uh, the, the genesis of this was that um, there was a, some some work done in uh, about five years ago that looked at uh, oncology medications by sales that were based on, on body size. They could either be on body surface area or on weight, uh, particularly on oncology. And they extrapolated the cost of the discarded medication. So the medication that does not go into the patient was approximated at about $1.8 billion. And then a lot of times that out-of-pocket payments that are based on coinsurance, not for the most part, most patients don't face this, but there are some that do. Um, the the coinsurance is based on the actual, the amount for the vial. So that's not based on the amount that actually was administered into the patient. That was, a, that was based on the vial um, that was charged. And so they are responsible. Theoretically, they are paying for some of the discarded medications. So there was an estimate that was done by, um, by CMS that, that uh, per their measurement, there was about $725 million on discarded medications in 2018. Um, and this is not penalized. This is one of those you actually report. If anybody's familiar with this, kind of obscure code called the JW modifier, that's actually where you report the amount of medication in vials that was, uh, that's discarded. That, that is still reimbursed, but they are attempting to track it. Um, and when they did the calculations, that's what this was done. But again, since it's not, it's often underreported and not enforced, it's likely that that is an underestimate of the total amount of, of medication that was discarded. Wow, so talk to us about how we resolve this issue, because I think some of these slides talk about approaches and how pharmacists are so integral, right, right in resolving these yeah. issues, right? So then um, CMS, uh, basically Congress, uh, the effectively Appropriations Committee uh, commissioned a study that was going to be funded through CMS to actually look at this very challenge and find out if there would be ways that we could reduce the amount of, of discarded medications. So this is just kind of an example of, of how policy is a challenge um, that pharmacists will get is that so there's even the regulatory guidance from the federal agencies was was not consistent. So when you look at the furthest left in yellow, you'll see that the kind of the FDA guidance, which basically says when you've got this uh, single use vial, that uh, there's it basically says you should use caution in terms of uh, how you actually should use that single use medication for potentially multiple patients, but it didn't really specify. And in fact, there was even some guidance that sort of hinted about how you could do some form of vial sharing. Now, CMS actually described how there is a mechanism for potentially repackaging single use vials, um, but didn't specify uh, exactly what the circumstances were and kind of gave you the impression that there's, there's, there's a limit to how vial sharing could, could persist. Then you have at the same time, again, these are all federal agencies, right, that are, that are coinciding. Actually, CDC actually had a campaign, you can see the brochures, that basically says one vial, one patient. So it actually stipulates there that you shouldn't be doing any form of vial sharing uh, per CDC. So you've got these, these kind of regulatory agencies that are, that are talking different recommendations and exactly what is a, is a clinic mm -hmm. or a health system to do if you are trying to reduce the amount of discarded med. Right, so what kind of activities were taken to resolve these discrepancies, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then this is, I think you can just click, click to Yeah, I'll just one. click to this one. So this off. one you can <laughs> sort of see the, the, the amount, potentially of the amount of discarded medication when you're at the one vial, one patient level, and to see that these three, the, with these three patients, we've got three vials, 
and the amount of medication that was discarded. And theoretically, if you do have a vial sharing program, and these do take place, we've talked to them, in, in other developed countries that have mechanisms for doing vial sharing, theoretically you could uh, take those two vials and uh, use them for more patients and have a reduction amount of discarded med. And I think what was interesting is this kind of wasn't going in on a vacuum. At the same time, if we were doing all this work, it was the pandemic. So there was all those conversations about how we are going to, if there's uh, six doses in a Pfizer vial or there was five, it was very much on the minds of all of us on the committee that preserving medication so that most patients could receive that and, and ensuring that um, this vital supply was protected, uh, was maintained. That was, that was going on at the same time, so it really added some urgency to the dialogue. That was, those were multiple-use vials versus a single dose. But the premise is still kind of the same. We needed to find ways to, that, uh, to make the most of, of our medications. Right. And I think what's fascinating, you shared with us the discrepancies amongst these three national agencies, but then hearing about the global efforts, right? Because waste and cost are not just common here in the U.S., but talk a little bit about how others perceive the work that's happening here in the U.S. Yeah, that was really <laughs> interesting. So we had some there in... Um, a few different, there was international discussion on that in that committee with um, some leading pharmacists from Australia, from Europe. Um, we actually looked at some of the vial sharing programs that they do in, in Canada. And so they had some pretty innovative practices um, using closed system transfer devices. So effectively these devices where when you're opening the vial, it's not exposed to the air. So um, you, can, you can theoretically safely do these kind of transfers. But what was intriguing is these places that we were learning from universally said, but we still look to the U.S. to set the guidance that we will then follow. So it was, it was, it was fascinating as re this role becomes very, very important globally because they will perpetually look to these FD, I mean, to U.S. agencies to kind of set the, the policies, mm -hmm. sometimes even when they were ahead of them. So I thought that was, that was really in interesting. And we, we also found that there are, some, there are health systems in the United States that have taken some um, some useful and, and evidence-driven uh, steps to try to mitigate discarded medications through vial sharing processes. But this is really something that it, it does make sense. You just have to know the right way to approach it, and we've got to get better about having those conversations. No, and I have to remark, Jonathan, we just finished up some work interviewing thought leaders on deprescribing, and I know Dr. Gray and Dr. Zulo will talk about that, and I heard the same quote, we look to the U.S. to really guide the way we look at research, that we look at outcomes, and by having your strength and your studies and your work helps us, but really, it's, it's a sharing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I think it's super exciting to have more global efforts and the pandemic really hit that. So as you say here, it's never been more important for pharmacists to guide policy. What do you mean by that? Can you expand upon that? Yeah, I, I think that there was, there was a lot of these discussions where it was, it was great to be at that table mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's amazing to be participating in this discussion. And, um, and a lot of times I'm the only pharmacist and that gets lonely, so you guys should to jump, join the effort, but, well, but it was more interesting is to find out is that if I wasn't there, mm -hmm. because then, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of the, the comments that were made, um, they just, there, there's too many of these things in pharmacy that basically, unless you're a pharmacist, you're, you're, those idiosyncrasies of, of how we do administration, of, of how we ensure that it's, it's the it's the correct compounding. All of those things, unless you do it, you're, you're not going to have an awareness of that and an awareness of uh, how you need to build in, in time and systems and policies to ensure that those things take place correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what really resonated here. And then when we finally got to the point of making the policy, um, you know, it says that the recommendation was that the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services should direct the CDC the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the FDA to work with the United States Pharmacopeia, a, a non-governmental agency, and other non-federal partners. But here's the part that I, I made sure was in there, is pharmacists have to be consulted in this dialogue if you want to make robust policy. Pharmacists, infectious disease experts to review and harmonize existing policies and guidelines on drug administration and repackaging. And so I think that was, um, you know, that, that was a moment that where I, I think my heart was really singing, is that to make sure that uh, by having pharmacists there, you can ensure that pharmacists remain there in terms of being participating in these dialogues, which will impact our practice. Mm -hmm. I think that this is, um, 
I think it's too harsh to say, like, if you're not the hammer, you're the nail, but it's, it's kind of like that. If you, if, if you do not help shape policy, you will be shaped by the policy, and this is why uh, it's so important that we participate in these dialogues. But this is a moment where, and it, there was no question, once we had the discussion and we were, and, and the pharmacist viewpoint was inserted in that, they weren't, they weren't going to have, they likely weren't going to have these recommendations without putting something in about pharmacists. Mm -hmm. so, but it, so it, it, you know, I, I don't want to say just like, yeah, it, you be there to make sure that they, they put the language in, um, but it, it certainly helps ensure that process. And so, um, I don't know, this was just a, a key moment where I, I was really pleased that that entered into the, the formal recommendations that, that went to Congress. No, and I think that's pivotal. We've learned by not having that one word inserted in the Social Security Act has been something we're still trying to fight for, for with years, provider yeah. status, right? Um, and I think the one thing is all of you as, you know, learners as well as leaders and, and those that are working through their career is as you're handing off those positions is grooming someone to take it, for right? Sure. So I'm finishing a tenure on an HHS committee and I said, we got to make sure a pharmacist stays on this committee because they hadn't had one on for 31 years. I was like, how could you not have a pharmacist? So I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, I, right? I think that that's, that's a key piece. It's almost part of policy is, is truly mentoring and grooming. It's the next generation, but it's actually just part of the process. Yeah. I think that kind of as you pull yourself up, you've got to be pulling the next person up because mm -hmm. A, they, they may be the ones that can, that can better execute the, the process you've started. Mm -hmm. And many times they will be able to, you know, the, uh, involving others, they will, they will take it further than you probably could have alone. Yeah. And so th this, is, this is really a team sport. And to just constantly looking for how you can, how you can mentor and champion the next generation to be involved in this. Um, and for academics, I think it's better. Mm -hmm. I think we need to kind of enhance our ability of training folks to be involved in, in policy and decision making. Absolutely. So I know this is a tough topic, yeah. drug cost and spending. We're not going to get political here, but uh, it easily could. We know that uh, cost of medications are quite honestly daunting. Unsustainable. Yeah. Thank you. Unsustainable. Yeah. So talk about unsustainable. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. Th this was um, this this was that dream project. So there was the and this is in its final form. Um, but there was this this real discussion to try to figure out exactly how we were going to continue to have a robust um, medication development system, but not break the, the system uh, due to the unaffordability that we've just, we've just shown. So this was, was, this was convening that group of an incredible cast of characters um, from, from basically different angles. I think that's what's other really important element about um, policy making, but any important decision, you've got to have all all participants, all stakeholders at the table, and we really did have folks that were, um, I won't say exactly who, but they were, they were diametrically opposed in terms of what their goals were. We've got, we had pharma, we had insurance companies, we had state um, health uh, administrators, we had attorneys, we had former senators, so there really was every different group that does have a vested interest in, in these policies going one direction, but they all had a, they all had an important viewpoint, and they were all important because if you don't have their buy-in, um, then they're, they're going to find ways to put in roadblocks. Mm -hmm. So getting them to participate in the discussion so they can, their voices can be heard are very, very important. And I think um, if, if you're not having your viewpoint challenged in some of these things, then you're probably not doing it right. Uh, you've got to have those viewpoints that, that are showing you where your blind spots are, and that is kind of gets to the other element. You really want to have diverse viewpoints um, and ensuring that they're at the table. No. And so this is a wonderful study that you led um, and uh, published a few years ago. And I think if I stand corrected, this problem is even worse now. It's just getting worse in terms of the top cost of drugs and how much are coming out of pocket yeah. with yeah. our Medicare beneficiaries. So talk a little bit about this study. Yeah, so this was um, some research I did with um, my dean, uh, Jan Hirsch, when we were actually still at, at UCSD. Um, and so we looked at basically Medicare Part D spending. All this data is all public. Yes. So that's the other great thing about what um, the Obama administration did was make sure that a lot of this data 
was available for policymakers and for researchers. So we looked at the, the Part D spend uh, since it had been uh, released, and we tracked uh, how much was spent on the top 10 medications from Part D, and then actually looked at the number of patients that received one of those top 10 medications. And what you can see on the, on the right in that little figure is each one of those dollar signs represents a billion dollars, and each one of the blue people represents one million patients, and you can see uh, that as we go across in time that the amount spent has uh, increased, and these are all on constant dollars, so these are in 2015 constant dollars. And then the number of patients who actually received those medications went down. So what we found was um, uh, there was a 32% increase in the total constant dollar spend, but there was a 32% decrease in the number of patients that actually received those medications. And the out-of-pocket spend actually went up. Why did this happen? It's because of the, um, the increasing number of specialty meds. So I think it went from one of, was of the top 10 um, when we began the analysis in 2011. I think it was four or five by 2015. Um, and the most expensive medication at the time in 2015 was uh, Sovaldi. So this is when the, right when the Hep C drugs were coming out, which were $1,000 a pill, uh, if many of you remember. Um, so without the low income subsidy, we saw that there was a huge amount of increased spend from the cost share perspective of patients. And so uh, uh, Dr. Hirsch and uh, Dr. Diane Chow, who actually does a lot of work, geriatrician that works with uh, the VA and the GWEP, uh, published this paper in JAGS but this just illustrates some of the challenge. And it's not that these medications are not effective, many of them are curative and life-saving, but it, it does get to the element of why um, Medicare and Social Security are gonna be bankrupt in 2030 and 2034 respectively, and then that is only accelerating. So we're gonna have to find ways, even if Congress just puts more money into Medicare, eventually that is paid for in tax dollars. Mm -hmm. So there is an impact regardless of, we kinda can't run away from this. We've gotta figure out a better way to, to approach it, and again, we want to make sure that we've got these robust medications for patients that need it, but we've got to find um, ways to make sure it's sustainable. Yeah, and I think more and more work needs to be done in terms of cost effectiveness, sure. and, right, and safety, especially some of these medications in older adults that are not always well studied. Exactly, so, not in the right population. Yeah, yeah, and I think all of us are probably challenged a little bit without getting in. I know there'll be a discussion as we yeah. talked a little bit about Eduhelm um, and that implication for the future. So we know there's lots of opportunities. So what are some of the things that you're doing uh, currently to help accelerate these? Yeah, I think, so. I mean, the, the end, and this was actually that, that mm -hmm. committee that served on it. So, um, um, and the fun part now is my office is at, at UCI is just two blocks down from where the National Academy of, Sen of Sciences West is positioned. So where this work was later on, my office kind of moved over there. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the goal of, of just trying to sustain um, market entry and, and the use of safe and effective generic medications I don't know if you guys have been following, but there's, for the first time now, there is an interchangeable uh, basal insulin, uh, Semgly, that uh, I think later this year, I think it's, it, they're supposed to have the FDA-approved interchangeable version of that will be available. Uh, but to, and that was, I think that was supposed to happen about 12 years ago. So, um, so there, to ensure that we do have a robust system of making sure that less expensive but uh, effective generics and biosimilars do come to market, we want to make sure that, um, that, that there is more transparency in terms of how the medication, uh, basically what the spend looks like and how the incentives are developed in our, in our medication payment system. And then, as you just mentioned, is, is finding ways that we incorporate value into our decision making. So medications that we really look at, what are the outcomes um, head to head on, on these medications and how do we incorporate how much they cost as well as what you're going to get. Yeah, it seems in California there's been a lot of leadership here in terms of looking at low-value care. I know some of that work came out of Michigan, yeah. but colleagues in the different University of California schools are also looking at that. What kind of things are you all doing at UCI and in terms of looking at low-value care? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, trying to identify places where they're um, from some of the large databases that both in claims as well as even mm -hmm. some of the, the University of California health data that we've had access to to really examine um, where are the places where medication use is occurring that just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense based on the evidence. So I think uh, a lot of the studies I'm looking at is, is just trying to correlate how value, value in terms of the outcome and utilization and then uh, tie that to national kind of prices and better define uh, where we could 
where gains could be made if we, if we really uh, had conversations more broadly about identifying which medications make sense and also looking at the patient populations based on some of their uh, demographics as well as their baseline comorbidities to find out if that medication makes the most sense for them based on their outcomes. So have you done any modeling? I know we talked a lot at this meeting about diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and we have multiple comorbidities. Are you doing any sort of modeling with the work that you're doing? I think right now we're, we're, we have a new platform that mm -hmm. I'm trying to work with just to actually do some of the, the large data analyses more quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, that has allowed us, we just published a paper in uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine that actually does look at both by, uh, by age and chronic disease mm -hmm. to figure out how um, correlations between that in the COVID space and hospitalizations. But I think we're hoping to, to take that the next step is, is to look um, more longitudinally, both before and after, on how those disease states uh, make a difference in terms of long COVID. Right. I think that's so impressive. And I think, I know we just tip touched on it briefly, but the emerging role of artificial intelligence and big data, right? And I think as pharmacists, navigating that, but also informing that, that model development is really critical. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and then and ensuring that, and being a part of those discussions that really say which, which medication, what, what's the conversation that's, that's meaningful? What are the material differences between different therapeutic categories and different medications? That, mm -hmm. To make sure that, almost that the work that they're doing is actually worth the time, and sometimes that, that, really does, that really does require a pharmacist. I would see that there's a lot of, it, it, it gets back to that, why we, we do need to do a better job of incorporating older adults in a lot of these studies. Um, one panel that I participated in, there was, it was actually a Medicare coverage determination that was based, since Medicare, right, so the bulk of it's, it's over 65, and the, the, the trials that they studied literally, I think, I think only 3% of the entire population for the trials that they were using were actually over 65. Mm -hmm. So many times what we were finding out is just that coverage determinations, decisions on these things are just being made without data that incorporates older adults that have multiple disease states, that are on multiple medications. They are generally not represented nearly enough in trials, and we've got to do a better job of that. And that's where real-world data really comes in, because until we have those, you're going to have to keep doing it, but, but we need to have the real-world evidence so we can look at those, mm -hmm. uh, those comparisons. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the pharmacist role. We were kind of hedging a little bit there with that discussion. So, and I know you've done some work on non-optimized medications yeah. and cost savings. So t this actually was probably the study that I read before I really got to know you. Um, it really sparked some of the intrigue about your work. And so speak to this study, because I'm sure a fair number of people may, or may be familiar, but may not. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this, was, this was basically the, what we, we, we tried to do was kind of do a, an update of, of some of the original work that was done on this topic back in the 90s to look at basically what is the cost of, of non-optimized medications, and, and we were interested in really kind of describing the, the pharmacist solutions that have, have since then been developed. And so we went back to kind of the original work and then tried to update it using uh, better data and, and more representative analyses of all the different costs and endpoints. The big ones really are this treatment failures. So that's when the situation where there's a medication that's, there's a, there's a, uh, a disease state that's amenable to treatment, but is not due to the medication not being optimized. That's the treatment failure. Then a new medical problem, that's when actually the treatment itself leads to another effectively syndrome. So um, maybe cough if you're on an ACE, um, uh, if you're not taking an anticholinergic, and, the, and then uh, it worsens dementia. Those are the kind of scenarios where actually the, the disease is actually from the treatment. That's the um, new medical problem, and situations where both occur. So those are all the scenarios where it's a non-optimized medication. And then in that incredibly simplistic decision model off to the right, you actually see that, um, that how that actually maps out based on current data sets that we had seen and, and new projections. And what we'd actually seen is the cost, the big one was actually the cost of, of long-term care had dramatically increased. So I don't really thought about this until <laughs> we're sitting here now, but actually this is very much uh, a great presentation for ASCP because one of the massive cost drivers for non-optimized uh, medications in the United States is, is actually 
attributable long-term care. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, because that's such a huge, uh, that is very, very expensive. So finding ways that pharmacists can be involved in improving that would reduce this monumental, so I, we, we captured it as $528.4 billion in 2016 uh, US dollars, and um, medical inflation's only increased since then. And so that, which amounts to about 16% of all healthcare spend at the time. So uh, a huge amount of money could be saved if we, if we had optimization of our, of our medications. Yeah, I have to tell you, when I, I use the word optimization with patients, they don't quite get it, yeah. Jonathan. So, you know, in our in our our sphere, you know, it makes sense. But I think, you know, uh, um, explaining that to older adults and those that care for it, but I think, you know, in the sense of symptom emergence or adverse effects and safety, I think those are things that resonate. So the study is really impressive. And I, I look at the authors, and besides, of course, yourself and Jan, but Terry McGinnis, talk about a leader that propels yeah. pharmacist as part of that team is really, really key. Yeah, I, there's Terry McInnes and then um, and, and Katie Capps, who's, uh, Terry McInnes is a physician, Katie Capps is a nurse, and these are the, the most staunch advocates, more than me, are champions of, of pharmacy. Like, they are out there fighting, cutting through the forest of trying to ensure that every patient who's, who is, basically has a chronic disease state is able to access a pharmacist to, to ask questions to provide their care. And so this, this is really, uh, this paper is really a testament that um, she was an engine to make sure that the, we delivered the work and that um, we, we described how the, these pharmaceutical care pathways could be better deployed. Um, so again, there, there, we have a lot of allies, you mm -hmm. know, and then just trying to make sure that we get our voice out so uh, that, that occurs. I think that that, um, that was, that was almost one of the other, the really fun parts about this. It took about two and a half years, this project, but it, it was worth every second because of what resulted, but even in the dialogues that we had. Right. No, it's a great, great piece. And as we know, there's a lot of work done on patient-centered primary care collaborative, which again, Terry was very involved with, and other pharmacy organizations. So I think many are familiar maybe with this framework, but do you want to explain it briefly? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just it, that... I think the big part about this, when, when we were talking about really where CMM fits in, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of alphabet soup about different places that pharmacists provide care, but I think if I had to boil it down, it's, it's that you've got access to the, the, the pharmacist has complete access to all of the patient's medical records, a treatment plan is developed that involves the patient, and there's longitudinal follow-up. So that there really is, you, you develop a treatment plan that, that is developed in, in coordination with the patient, and it's not this cross-sectional kind of one-off. You are part of the CMM process is that there's going to be, there is going to be follow-up visits. You're gonna find out how they're doing, you're gonna make modifications of that, and you're working with the other members of the healthcare team, but you do have complete access to the information. I think that that's how it, um, uh, medication therapeutic management has its important place and I'm an advocate of it, but it is distinct in terms of um, that, could be, that could be based on you actually see some um, drug-drug some interactions or some adverse events or a list of polypharmacy or their beers criteria, and you make some changes and you kind of send it in um, as a recommendation. This is distinct from that because you are part of the coordinated care that goes forward, and you're going to be available to continue to make modifications. So um, if there isn't a next visit or a next check-in, then it's it's not really CMM. No, and I think as these models evolve, right, even some of the demonstration models for the enhanced MTM, we'll some it'll be yeah, you're doing in, some incredible yeah, work. intriguing to see what's working and what's not. So um, talk about the leaders in shaping health policy and some of the work you're doing there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is just kind of my considerations to wrap up before we hopefully open up to some great questions. Is yeah. um, is that uh, pharmacist involvement in, in health policy for the benefit of of patients first and foremost, uh, other clinicians, I think that is part of that quadruple aim, quintuple aim is also making it that, uh, that clinician provider uh, wellness is part of the equation, uh, helping society kind of deal with these things as we know that, um, as what we learned from the pandemic is um, pharmacists are incredibly important, that's never gonna be forgotten if you think if you read just about anything, now when it comes to vaccinations or um, 
things related to the PrEP Act or monoclonals, pharmacists, a lot of times, they're, they're the first thing that you talk of because many times they're, they're almost in front of the front line. That's the easiest access point to healthcare. So um, that part is going to, to only continue. Um, the folks you see off to, which is it, to the right, um, that is actually the now mayor of San Diego, but when he was the assemblyman of San Diego, Todd Gloria, he sponsored um, the CMM bill, so that would, have, that would have covered comprehensive medication management for those that met certain criteria in our state Medicaid program. So um, we really do have allies, and then um, uh, to his left is Lorianne DiMartini, who's a BCGP and CEO of ECSHP, and she kind of shepherded this project to try to see where it got through. It actually was passed unanimously in the Senate Health Panel, but it got stuck in the uh, effectively appropriations. So many times it comes down to how you're going to pay for things. Um, but this was, you know, this was a politician that was, was fired up about, about a pharmacist's cause. I don't think it was because it was pharmacist. He, he thought it was the, the right thing to do, and we were able to work with him and, and present to him on many things. And so... Um, I think as we continue to see uh, more, more challenges, um, kind of health-related challenges that are amenable to, to medication-related activity, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to really, we've got to take that opportunity. I think that the, the pandemic really, as I said, that, you know, the silver lining is um, now they're going to they're gonna continually ask for pharmacists to participate in these discussions, whether you like it or not. And so it's better, to, it's better to be prepared to have those discussions. And I think you mentioned a great point, right? So there's a huge amount of burnout, right? Now that they've got, it's a busy pharmacy, mm -hmm. a 24-hour pharmacy, they're, they're understaffed, and now they've got to do all of these vaccinations for all the people that just find out now that they qualify for a booster. Right. Now they're all there trying to beat the rush in the morning. So now that's all other of these kind of chainsaws that you have to try to juggle. But I think that's why, again, you actually need more pharmacists to Volma to try to set policy so pharmacists are protected from those scenarios right. as we kind of build more. I think, it's, I, I think just trying to, to try to avoid any of those things, you can only do that for so long before um, uh, the system is going to say, no, you're going to have to do it. And that will allow you to help shape reimbursement policy and these other things that we're going to need uh, to make sure it's sustainable. No, and putting other uh, safety nets in place. Um, there's some self-assessment questions, but I want you all to go to the Q&A app and make sure that you enter any Q&A questions for Jonathan and I, um, but we'll ask you a couple as we comb through these. Which of the following was associated with increasing likelihood of cutting pills or skipping doses in data presented? What do you guys think? Okay, very good. Awesome. Question number two. The growing presence of which category of medications has been associated with increasing cost in Medicare Parts D top 10 medications by spend? Awesome. Great. We're getting it all right. All right. Which of the following was recommended to reduce societal costs attributable to medications? What do you guys think? Boy, we are giving you all A's here, right? Yeah, we knew we would only have so much time, so we gave you the first answer. All right, so this is great. How does a pharmacist become part of a governmental policies and procedures? Where do you start? Um, I, I think for me, it, it really started basically even when I was in school, but I, I think a lot of that was just finding out places where uh, you, are, you are interested in helping and, and then asking how you, can, how you can help. I think that a lot of, uh, for me, actually, in many ways, it actually was, it was my former dean at UCSD, Palmer Taylor, who actually just saw some of the activities that I was doing related to managed care, and they were just saying like, oh, this, that sounds like a lot of what you're doing uh, sounds like what uh, they're trying to achieve in DC, so let's see if we can uh, make some movement there. Yeah, I think mine was more local. So I started on a state committee called the Mortality Review Committee, but I learned so much about uh, deaths from medication um, in vulnerable populations. And from there, I was very fortunate to work through up to national policies. And yeah, so that's how we started. So start, just get started yeah. in whatever you, you know, and be present. And if they ask you to chair it, you take it on and lead because it gives you an opportunity as well. But definitely seek out mentorship. Yeah, you're there. never going to feel quite right. 
ready. No. So don't wait for that. Don't wait yeah. for it. Absolutely not. All right. Did you read the Bottle of Lies? I read sections of it. Uh -huh. So I think it's, I can't really comment vociferously without knowing more about it. But I do believe that, that our drug distribution system does need to be uh, better looked at, almost for, sometimes for national security purposes. I will say that um, we have to ensure that everything is ev evidence-driven and that we look at the entire story. Um, so that, uh, that is kind of what I have to say about that. But I, I do believe that there's, there's certainly places where we need to look at how we can reform um, all of our drug distribution system, including generics. So we touched a little bit on specialty medications. What is your opinion? I think that, and we had a little yeah, bit of discussion about this, is um, when it comes to white bagging and brown bagging, I mean, I think those are good, um, those are good temporary solutions. I think at the, mm -hmm. at the end, that still seems to be a, 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 an, an additional step that we would like to try to avoid if we're just trying to, if we're trying to do kind of harmonized, efficient care. So I think ultimately we are going to have to come with, with a mechanism that um, doesn't involve so many intermediaries in terms of kind of paying for medications and administering them. We have some wow, we interesting, go. yeah, some great questions here. All right, we'll go to this one. What do you suggest to motivate stakeholders, um, insurers, payers, providers to change the system? Um, in one word, I would say transparency. So mm -hmm. I think if we actually forced um, more sunlight on a lot of these discussions on basically where the, the flow of money is occurring and what the incentives are. And I think that there is some of that work that was effectively mandated by the last administration that is actually having a little bit of impact in terms of showing what some of the prices are and, and what some of the deals are. Um, I think that would help motivate challenging or changing the system. I remember I went to this one great meeting where there was, um, there was a neurologist in D.C. and he just kept, he just stands up and t at the National Academies, you can say whatever, everything is open to public comment. And so he just said, uh, I always remember, he just said, stop calling this a healthcare system. This is not a system, right? And so um, I, th I think that's part of it is right now, it, it, uh, you kind of get what we've designed, which is way too much complication and, and not a lot, a lot of regular flow. So, uh, but I, I do believe that if we made things a little bit more transparent, that a lot of these other changes could occur. Um, and I think that there's got to be more ways that you can um, look at price as a discussion point and, and deciding what... Um, care is going to be provided. Absolutely. We're going to take this last question because I want to make sure we have time to give you your award. So um, how can our pharmacy curriculum be updated for our future leaders? I have ideas. But I want to hear yours. I actually want to hear yours. I think uh, <laughs> first and then uh, mine will, will take more than 52 seconds. Yeah, yeah, more than 52 seconds? Okay, and because then I have to go give the award. Um, I think, you know, the more opportunities we can give students to have models, but also to practice. Um, I know in our school we've started up a pharmapreneurism program, um, but getting students at national meetings, getting them involved in committees like we have done at ASCP and other organizations. And I think as schools of pharmacy, we should be encouraging that and supporting that. And I think all of you as preceptors or emerging preceptors or potential preceptors need to help that as well but we're always looking for more opportunities yeah so I, I, and I would the same kind of similar vein is just get find out ways to provide uh, practical experiential opportunities mm -hmm. to really just get them able to do the process I'm like the I always like the MCP like PNT competition because yes. they just really get to do real work and so um, yeah Come on up, Chad, while you're here. We started without you, but we'll finish with you. So really excited to thank Dr. Watanabe for his amazing thank lecture. You. And do you want to hand him the award? This I is. Hand it to you. I'll say things. And okay, you say you. things. Absolutely. <laughs> this is number one. Thank of you course, so much. you're not at Maryland, but we hope you come oh. someday. And then, of course, this is the beautiful award too. Oh, this, is the um, this is the one. And okay. congratulations for all your leadership, thank you so much. your research, all your hard work. It. I can't even thank you enough. Thank you. So excited, and I know we'll be working together more Always. in the future. Yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, we can do this. We can do that. Yeah, do that. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you on behalf of ASCP. Thank you, Nikki, for our partnership with the Lamy Center Absolutely. and your award, uh, Jonathan Watanabe. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. It's thank always you. Always yeah. awesome to have such exceptional people come and speak. Thank you very much. Members. I do have to give, and I do want to dedicate the, this presentation to Joy Pline. Um, she was a, a great colleague and, and an even better friend. And um, uh, when I was at University of Washington, 
um, doing my PhD in the Department of Pharmacy Practice, and there's, uh, there's many a cold, dark, I mean, Seattle, like many a cold, rainy night, and then when you're working on your PhD and on weekends and holidays, and Joy was, was just always there, you know, and, and she was just always there to provide incredible um, guidance and knowledge, and one of those that just almost anticipated questions you were going to have and was there to help you with them. And so, um, I don't know, I, I, I miss her dearly, but I think that with uh, Laura Hart, I mean, she will, she's kind of immortal and living through all those she touched. Um, yeah, there's never be anybody who personifies their name like, like Joy Pline. Um, so, yeah, this is for her. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we are on to the next session. Oh, is there another session? I oh, think I it's know. five o'clock. <laughs> is it? Yeah. I know I'm off to somewhere else. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so well, much. Well, thank you all for attending. Thank you, appreciate it.